my test. Okay, so uh, what we'll do right now is that if any of you have questions, you can feel free to fire it away. Just make sure you sort of introduce yourselves, tell us uh, who are you, where are you from, and um, let us know who you're directing your questions to, whether it's to someone specific or like it's just a general group thing. Uh, okay? Um, before we start, why not I get the ball rolling? The ball right? Okay, so we start off in a not so serious way. Lah. Can we find out from uh, each of you? What's your favorite bot? Tell us why it's your favorite one and why and like, like how, how, how well did it do? You're, you're not supposed to say your own. <laughs> Choose something else. But not I think that's quite easy eh, because we got, we got any here. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> How about one uh, local and one international board? Okay. Besides, besides the bus uncle, you mean? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, yeah. because, yeah. because that's everybody's favorite board. Yeah. Don't cheat, don't cheat. Okay. Uh, stop in there, maybe since you're here. Local one, uh, is taxi board. Uh, why? Why? Because uh, I take Grab and Uber pretty often, and I'm really one of the cheapskate guys that compare prices all the time. So I, I don't use it for like only convenience, I use it for price as well. So that's why I think taxi board is pretty good. And by the way, taxi board, uh, Founders are there if you want to speak Founders to them here, as well. Right? Yeah. Okay, see you say hi. Oh, okay. Introduce Hello. yourself, say one, say your name. I am Amos. Amos, yes. Hi, I'm Natasha. All right. Hello. Woo. Are you guys from SMU also? Uh, NUS. 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 All right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it becomes a school thing now. So that's the local one. Uh. Yes. International? International. Okay, I saw one bot. Uh, you can take picture of your face, right? It uses machine learning to make you look like a freak. So it, makes, it makes you look cool. It's called F8. Uh, I8. I yes. Alphabet I then Alphabet eight. Yeah, like three hundred thousand plus people liking the bot or something. Oh. So it's like a Instagram kind of technology, but they they just up the game uh. So that one's pretty cool as well. Well, what what drew you to that bot? And how do you discover it? How did I discover it? Uh? That's a good one. Uh. How do we discover bots nowadays? <laughs> Media, maybe. Media, yeah. Botlist.co if you want to know. Mm. Botlist.co. Botlist.co. Yeah, so that's created by some venture big guy who he literally curates all the bot in the world, so it's good for us also. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay. Maybe Abi. Um so for favorite local bot? Uh. Um I actually really like golf.sg. Golf.sg. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's key replies for what they released uh, awesome. for the government recently. Um why? So the thing is uh, when I go through a government app or go through uh, a government website. I, I expect something to be really boring, mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that wouldn't excite you as much. But when I was talking to the Gov. SG bot, uh, I felt a lot more engaged than I expected to be uh, because there's a lot of different functions, and I think they've simplified it really well, uh, and they make it uh, very usable. You you get to know everything you want to know about the government. So yeah, the Gov. SG bot is really cool. Um, for my favorite international bot, uh, it's definitely Hey Poncho. Uh, so Poncho is your weather cat, uh, and, and Poncho will tell you about uh, weather. It's, I mean, how the weather is at your current place. I always use Poncho uh, and ask, should I take the umbrella out today? And Poncho always gives me like the exact correct reply on whether I should take the umbrella out. It's cool. really cool. Okay. Nice. Okay, maybe then let me start with uh, local. Okay, um, local bots, I think, I can't say bus uncle, I can't say taxi bot now, because I've now been cheating, so <laughs> I, need to, I need to be a bit more creative. I can't say our own bots also, so. Yeah, I cannot. I think, okay, I think maybe um, right now, because I haven't tried Asura before this, I'll say what I like about Asura. Because I, okay, there's not that many bots in the local space, so please do this, go build more bots. <laughs> but Asura, I think, uh, is actually pretty interesting to me because what I like about the interaction was that you know they made it really easy for you to upload images and you know essentially the categories are very clear and then they made use of all the <coughs> messenger features for the categories and stuff and it, it reminded me a little bit about this um, this concept of market research using bots if you look at it um, you know it's very useful for for example brands um, for companies to be able to use that um, and I think that's a, one of the really quite interesting things and I think I what I like is the visualization how they included the visualization of the percentage and all that in the in the pictures automatically I think that it, it's a very good implementation yeah that's what I like about it um, and then. 
I think international wise, um, I will cheat a little bit. I won't actually say a messenger bot because I think there's a lot of messenger bots. They're pretty good, so I can't really pick one. But I think one that I really, I used every single day now is Google Assistant on my phone as well as on my Google Home as well. So I really like that um, and I use it as an alarm clock, as a music player, I use it as a way to remind me what's happening tomorrow and all these kind of things as well. So I think if you look at bots, um, it's not just about chat, it's also about voice. So um, you know, I think that's one of the interesting things that's happening and I, I, I try to keep myself in, in touch with that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, now that we sort of get a bit warmer, anyone from the ground has any questions for our panel? Uh, I'll hand you all the mic again. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, let us know who the question is to enter to. Uh. Nobody. Going once, going twice. Okay, don't have. Then I will continue. She's almost like a one or three already. <laughs> okay. Can we ask uh, you questions? <laughs> Can we ask you questions? <laughs> ask me questions. No, I'm very shy. <laughs> we can ask each other questions. Maybe we go through my list first. I, I got some here already curated. Uh, some of these questions here are uh, asked from our community members who are not able to join us today. Okay. So, um, you know what? Maybe I will throw a question to Abi. Is that fine? Okay. So, um, this question is for someone who is looking to build his own uh, consumer chatbot. Um, he's wondering, right? Uh, I'm not sure whether it covered just now. He, wa he wants to know, for his chatbot to be successful, right? Uh, can you name maybe three success metrics uh, he should be looking at from sort of day one? Okay, so the three success metrics. Uh. Um, I would say definitely uh, the number of messages per session is one success metric. Um, so you can actually build your bot uh, in a way where you engage the user, where you ask them to say a lot of things, but you might also build your bot in a way that actually doesn't accept so many uh, messages from a user. Like if if you want to build a really engaging bot, uh, if a u if a if a user asks one question to the bot and the bot gives a unique answer, <coughs> the user gives asks like four or five other unique questions and the bot gives like four or five other unique answers. That gives you an idea that that the user is actually engaged in the conversation. And um, if and, uh, and, and as that number keeps increasing that will that that be a, one of the success metrics. Another way that this might uh, come off as a as another, another thing that people might mistake this for is uh, if a bot is very limited in a way where you can ask the bot only like two or three questions, but you see that the user is asking like ten or ten to twenty questions. It 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 also means that your bot's not performing because the user keeps reinforcing uh, the same input to the bot. Uh, that might not be a proper success metric. So basically, I, I would say like if if a user speaks to a bot more, it's, it's definitely a success metric. And when they speak to the bot, it has to be like different ways of speaking to the bot. Um, another uh, success metric for a bot, um, I'd say the retention rate. So the retention rate, I define retention rate as uh, how likely it is for a user to speak to your bot the next day after the first time they spoke to your bot. So you, if you connect to a lot of analytics platforms, uh, or different bot analytics platforms. Uh, some examples are Dashbot, that IO, and some example, there's also bot analytics. Bus Uncle uses uh, Facebook analytics. They actually give you a measure of how likely a user would be to speak to your bot, like on a daily basis. You need to keep ensure, ensuring that this number keeps going up. Um, but, but then again, there's another side to this. If your bot spams the user, like every day, it might make this metric go up and it might make you feel good, but actually it's just about spamming your user. Uh, so you better, you should watch out for that, for retention rate. Uh, finally, maybe the number of shares of the bot also is a good success metric. Because bots are a very new platform. Um, if, you, if you see that more users share your bot, it shows you that uh, they're interested and they want to tell their friends about it. Even they're, they're new to the space, even you're new to the space. But by sharing your bot, 
or sharing messages from your bot, users are saying, yes, we agree with you. Uh, bots are definitely a nice space and we should spread the message around. Yeah. Okay, maybe I just follow up one more uh, part two for, for that if you don't mind. Um, you were you you talking about not spamming your users too much, but yet at the same time, if you don't send them your notifications, then it's difficult to put them back. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how do you balance between not over spamming, number one, and number two, making sure that uh, whoever that is using your bot is still engaged? Um, so I think when what we normally count as spam is uh, a message that's very generic. So we, we get a lot of spam emails, but when you read the spam emails, the most personal that these emails can get is, hey, first name, <laughs> right? So the thing is, when you read a, a message from a bot like, hey, first name, and a long paragraph, you know it's spam. Like, you know it's something that they probably sent it to everyone out there. But if you want to actually send your uh, messages to your users, uh, you should be able to customize the message to them in such a way that you tell them, I, I know things about you based on what you've told me before, and uh, I'm sending you this message because it might be of use, of use to you. I know that you like A, and I know that you told me B before, why don't you go try this? So that'll actually, I feel make, uh, uh, I feel that would actually make the user feel more uh, like comfort, comforted with the bot. They won't feel like it's spam anymore. Um, so that's one way you can actually spam your user. And it's safe. Say spamming. <laughs> why, why hat? Why hat? OK, thanks, Abhi. Uh, any other, anyone has a question? All right. OK, I will go to both of you. So OK, I'll pass you the mic. Actually, so when people use normal websites or apps, uh, actually, this question is directed at everyone, actually. So when people use normal websites or apps, if there's a particular bug on a screen, we would get like a crash log or a crash report where we get to know where the problem is. Uh, but what sort of strategies do you guys use for detecting bugs in the uh, bot conversations that you guys are having? Like what if a person goes in an endless loop where the same question keeps coming up again and again? Or if a person drops off a conversation because they didn't quite get what they expected. So how do you guys go about detecting this and uh, and taking action on it? Uh, your name? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Suresh. Um, I'm, an I'm an engineer here at 99.co, the property portal. Yeah. Do you all need a bot? <laughs> <laughs> do you all need a chatbot? Not at this point. There's Spencer. <laughs> I'll try it. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, for us, right, we start off with the big picture planning. Like the UX we think is really important. Yeah, like in websites we also we also plan how websites should look like. Then uh, we plan the you know blank state, right? So what happens is the thing cock up everything. So in chatbots we are also trying to uh, get used to it. I think it's still quite new for everyone. Yeah, so like Abi mentioned like there's certain like storyline. So we have to identify every storyline very carefully to make sure that once it goes off, how we can direct them back. So it's like trying to cover all angles. It's actually, the, the, the methodology is quite similar to building a website or mobile app as well. It's always the blank state that caused the problem or, or when user go off. So it's when, it's about predicting how that happens, planning the UX and then try to reverse engineer such that you predict that if that happens, you have a certain call to action back to the, to the blank state. Yeah, but if it really happens, you need to ask the pro already. <laughs> which is the all these people who have uh, built the bots longer time. Yeah, but other than that, I think it's about the planning, the first stage of the, before you even start building the bot, the UX, the piece of uh, prototyping tool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think for us, I think when we, so I, I definitely agree with the user experience point, I think that, you know, a lot of the work needs to be done on the front part. Um, but maybe I can talk a little bit more about practical things that you can do, for example, if let's say after you launch a bot, you know, like then all these things happen, right? You realize that uh, you have too much traction or so on, and you really need to make sure that, you know, you kind of capture all these uh, fallbacks. So one, one thing you can do is actually, you can identify the last message that, um, for every single user, you can actually do a quick pull of like the last message that the user actually um, sent to the bot, right? And that's actually a good way to identify where they usually stop interacting with the bot, 
right? And you realize that a lot of these users, for example, let's say 60 percent, 60 percent of the users stop interacting with the bot after a certain point, and it, it 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 becomes surprising to you, then you might want to also like look into what is it that you know maybe you can drive them down that funnel. Maybe it could be that, or after they click on news, there's no follow up action after that, right? Then you 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 might want to think about maybe adding some like additional follow-on uh, actions or suggestions or stuff like that. So, or, or even making the content like more rich or so on. So, I think this last this last message send thing is actually quite interesting. Um, so, um, one of our friends at uh, GetBot Metrics, they actually focus on this metric quite a bit, um, you know, in their visualization for bot analytics. Um, another thing you can do is, um, like the bot loops and everything, right? I think you can write a couple of like, you know, um, automated scripts and stuff to essentially make sure that you identify some of these things. So more automated testing, more automated stuff, uh, that would be very, very helpful. Um, and then, I think beyond that, um, I'm probably blanking out right now on some of the other things that we've done, uh, but of course, you know, general user feedback, testing, just like really aggressive testing internally, you know, trying through everything, getting more users to try it, and essentially just, even at, as sometimes stop stopping your early users, I think that would be really helpful for you to really identify where they are stopping on. But at the end of the day, when someone talks to someone, if you are sitting in that conversation in that room with the person and you are listening to them, you kind of know from a third party what's wrong, right? And sometimes, um, you know, yes, you can write automated scripts and everything to identify all this, but the best thing sometimes is really just looking at the conversation. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, at the early days when you do focus groups and stuff, that will be very important. Yeah. Um, so, if you've noticed the bane of the bot industry is, uh, sorry, I don't understand. So, almost every bot has this fallback um, where it says I, it doesn't understand. Even though you write a bunch of different functions, uh, a bunch of different ways of processing a message in your bot, you will always have something called a fallback uh, in, in almost every one of these functions. And when you track the users and, and you notice that a lot more data is going into the fallback loop rather than your main loop, you know that something is wrong. You know that there's a bug. Or you know that a user is performing an action that's not intended and therefore is just going to the fallback. So what I try my best to do is reduce the fallback rate. Like, make sure the bot, I mean, minimize the rate at which the bot says, sorry, I don't understand. Okay, so the next person is Chris, right? You got a question? Hi, everybody. Um, I don't remember all the names in front, so I apologize. I came in pretty late, and I wasn't really paying attention to the repeat the names again. Uh, which is directed to all three of you. Um, I, I, oh, I, I work in the uh, VR and virtual reality space. I, I just invested in a uh, virtual reality business, so it's not really quite related to what you guys do. But my concern is security related. What are the security and reliability concerns that keep you guys up at night? And I want three from each of you. <laughs> because one is a cop out, two is an excuse. I want three. <laughs> okay. You guys something to start, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Must be. laughs> Security concern. Uh, first concern I'm afraid of is that any of one of us get hit by a bus. Um, or like our laptops are hijacked. Or, or like um, we access an internet that is like snooped on by someone. I mean, these are all practical things, right? Um, because at the end of the day, when we work, um, you know, with, if you are a small team and you work with enterprises, you are the biggest security risk to the enterprise uh, when you work with them. Um, and uh, which is why they ask you this question, how many people do you have? And if you have less than, you know, for example, 10 people, they will look at you and you're like, are you sure you can support our needs? You know, and they use this like, you know, qualification question to essentially ask you to go away. Um, it's easy for a company to do that, right? Which is why I think the easy path is, the easier path, not the easy path, right? It's very hard. Um, but the easier part is, you know, let's not do B2B and, you know, let's like do um, consumer focused stuff. I think for us, we, we, we like hammering our heads against these kind of problems. So we kind of overcome that. So yeah, so that's what keeps me up actually. But if customers come to me, if every customer today comes to me and tell me, um, you guys are the security risk, we're not going to work with you, then I need to solve that. The second thing is actually, um, I think maybe on the infrastructure side, um, if we work with companies that are very prominent, the problem is that that itself invites security risk. Because um, people all over the world are being paid um, handsome amounts of money to crack open these enterprises and essentially try to screw over with their business. And if they do that, it's a badge of honor. 
So we are also a little bit careful about announcing who we work with as well sometimes because I think that's something that um, might be a bit sensitive and we don't want to become a target ourselves. So recently, for example, one of our previous products, uh, we actually became a target of a, of a guy who just started doing lots of, he wrote like a couple of scripts to attack us for no reason and essentially that lo overloaded our email servers um, quite a bit. So we have to like, essentially do a lot of countermeasures and stuff. So you know, th these kind of things like, you know, do happen and we are uh, wary of that. I think the third thing is that for bots, I think uh, right now Facebook and all these platforms do a pretty good job already. So for example, people cannot really abuse the bot too much. If someone tried to like, for example, um, bomb the bot with like maybe like 10, 10 million conversations uh, every second, Facebook will break limit the user and immediately do that for us. So I think thanks, thanks to Facebook, that's good. But when we launch on like, for example, companies' websites or like applications application and stuff, then we need to make sure that we handle some of these things ourselves or work with the party to do that. So that's something that I that keeps my team up at night uh, when we think about this. Um, so Spencer has answered like a lot of security risks on a B2B point of view where you build bots for other people, but I don't have any of those answers because I'm not doing bots for other companies. <laughs> um, so for security risks for building your own bot. Uh, or, at least, or at least what do other developers need to look at? Sorry, could you repeat that? Or at least what do other developers need to look at and think about if anything else. Okay. If, if that's not the, the kind of experience you've had. For example. Right. So, uh, so in my presentation, I, I had uh, shown like the three main parts of what I think it takes to build a bot. The first part is the messenger platform. Uh, the first part is a messaging platform. That's the part that, that's the only interface to the user. And the other two are the web server and the machine learning uh, platform, but that happens in the background. That's in the back end and it's not interface to the user. Um, the biggest security risk is the part is any part of your app or any part of your bot that is interfaced with a user because that's a point of entry for the user. Um, luckily, if you use a very popular messaging platform like Facebook, Facebook shields you. They shield you from uh, any kind of attacks that uh, users may try to do in your bot. Um, Previous, I mean, previously, uh, if you didn't have Facebook and you just accepted plain text from users, they could always do some kind of SQL injections or uh, <laughs> so these, these kinds of things that'll trigger uh, these malicious threats to your bots, but, but Facebook shields you. Um, I'm pretty confident that even Slack as a platform would also shield you in that way, and so do all the other messaging platforms. Um, you just want to ensure that the points of entry uh, to, to your bot are just limited and only Facebook knows that single point of entry. Yeah. Okay, maybe I can share a bit about uh, ethical hacking since uh, that's what I've been doing for quite some time before we do the business. Yeah, so uh, in the website world, right, I think it works similar to, to bot as well. So when Sometimes our website gets hit by some random hacker in like Morocco or Pakistan, then our web pages just change, right? So it's, it's a real problem that happens to, I think it will happen in the bot as well. So last time when we did it, uh, for those of us in the IRC generation, if you all remember, MRIC, there was this group called Ethical Hackers, and then the idol there was like Sean Parker, the, the founder of Napster. So he drops in once in a while to hand some message. So that time I was a really young kid. So that time, well, we, you know this game called Neopets? Yeah. Yeah, new pets, right? Wow. You're so old. So. <laughs> yeah, it sucks out a lot of our time, right? But we wrote a lot of scripts, right, to 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 get more new points. Yeah, so but how we do that is we go into other people's account and get their new points. Because we we can't hack the algorithm to increase our own new points on a passive basis. We so we're gonna get it. Fun <laughs> yeah, so we, 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 found it, we found that more fun than playing the game Neo Pets itself. So, <laughs> so it's like, if Abi is my friend, I'm just going to take all his Neo Points and then we had more fun doing that. And technically, at that period of time where web security was really low, it's easy to write scripts to do that. So it came upon a time whereby people start to, people start to hire people to prevent people like us. So what happens is we have to write a script to prevent people to prevent us. So it stacks up, you see, and, and that's how uh, technology gets better. So the guy that's trying to prevent me from, he has to write a script that directs me away to another IP. So I see like a fake Neopets site, even if I put neopets.com. So, so he directed me away, and then the, the real user uh, goes, to, goes to this account. So they track by uh, like IP tracking. So it comes to a point where like, there's three, four layers of ethical hacking, such that I can't be bothered anymore. <laughs> it's too difficult to crack after that. Yeah, but I, I believe there's still people doing it. 
So that that's one way that we have that we can uh, we can counter it. So all the ethical hackers, right? They they tend to write scripts that are like three to four layers deep. Meaning, if you get hacked, what are you gonna do? So it's it's like when you plan the it's a it's a UX for hackers. Is it is a UX for hackers? So you plan like if if this fellow is gonna hack, what happens next? But if he, if it didn't break through, okay, good. So you go back to your normal state. Then next one, if if it breaks through the hacking thing, what happens after that? Yeah, so if I break through to his new points, are you going to stop me from taking the new points? Or are you going to boot me out of the system such that I log out? Mm. But if you still can crack that, then it goes to the next layer. So ethical hackers need at least uh, like three layers. So on a context basis in business, not uh, on gaming anymore. Yeah, so we work with uh, uh, GIC. Okay, so this part we can share, no worries. So how we counter this thing is, uh, we try to do it in such a way that even if they manage to hack our board, they can't extract any important data. Yeah, so so we always uh, we advise people who come to us or like companies that want to buy services try to try to segregate as many parts as possible. So some coders they write a really fast code, like one file has the everything like the whole file .js or the whole file .py. So the entire the entire system runs on one script. You see, so when they can extract anything from that script, right, it becomes a problem. So I can change like sgbus uncle become sgbus auntie, and I can give you the wrong location to make you pissed off, and I can do this. Yeah, but I think probably Avi writes it in different layers. So he, he separates the thing out here and there such that even if the first layer gets hacked, there's still the second layer, then the third layer. So that's one of the ways we do it. And then we do backup servers. For example, like, um, like if information number one gets hacked, but information number one is really important for your daily activities, it will bounce to the second database of information one. So exactly the same thing is like, it's, like, uh, it's copied, but such that if, it's, if, it, if it reads a malicious thread, it goes to the next one straight away. And it goes, so it reads another malicious track, it goes to the next one. So you have to do a lot of stacking. And the, the, the fortunate thing is big companies pay for that. Yeah, so they're willing to pay money to, to counter this thing. And same thing is also three layers. Yeah, so any ethical hacker will also tell you anything, three layers. Because the third layer onwards, people I like ask can't be bothered. <laughs> yeah, because we don't make any money, we just hack for fun. Uh, and previously, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Max. I'm the CTO of Key Reply. So I just want to add a two more points to the previous discussion about security of bots. I think there are two main points. Um, first is the API that you use to um, pass the user's message over. So for us, we couldn't use anything like with AI or API to act because we can just cannot send the user information to external parties. without. Because usually, if you read clearly the with AI contracts and their terms and conditions, they actually say they, they have um, sort of ownership of your any message you send to them. So they can read it if they want to. So that, that alone just doesn't fly with any enterprise. It just doesn't work. So, uh, that's why we have to develop our in-house sort of um, NLP processing to um, understand the, um, all the messages and intents and entities that the third party are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to sort of put it into the private, deploy private clouds, so in, in case that the company um, just super sensitive with all this, we can actually put it into their computers and their servers. The second point is about Facebook Messenger platform. So most of the libraries that you, that you see on GitHub today, doesn't actually protect you from denial of service. So a hacker can, once they figure out which endpoint that your bot server runs on, um, there are ways to check, um, like figure out that out. Once they figure it out, they can spoof as a user and send like millions of messages directly to your uh, backend server, for example, your Heroku server or Amazon server. Um, at that point, you can't just it, it, you, you have to do some verification to check that this actually came from Facebook. Um, otherwise, you'd be like wasting your API calls to uh, your, all your other s services and then your, your rate limit will explode and then your, you just, your real users couldn't get any message through. So um, the way to do it is um, there's a signature that Facebook sends called uh, XHub, um, XHub signature and it uses a SHA-1 algorithm. So, your Node.js code, usually you have to implement it yourself, or you have to uh, be very sure to check which open source library you actually use and whether they implemented that um, authentication. Um, if you don't, anyone can just bring down a bot instantly. So uh, that's, that's, uh, if, if you want to know which, like, how to exactly implement that, you can kind of ask me later. I can show you the code. Thanks, Max, for uh, adding that on. Uh, anyone else? Any questions? All right.
Uh, thanks. Uh, um, my name is Kiha. I'm working at insurance as a data analytics manager. So uh, this year is going to be a digitalization of insurance companies. Like an insurance company is a traditional, quite traditional, but so they know there is time to change. So we are thinking bringing the chatbots in a two ways. One is customer service. Uh, the other is uh, finding our prospects. Uh, mainly Facebook. In, in Korea is Kakaoto. I think it's quite a popular platform. Equivalent of WhatsApp in Singapore. Uh, the, for the customer service, I think uh, if we bring in the chatbot, there must, there must be lots of you know, different, there is freedom of questions like uh, how to claim, the process, uh, what's the claim process, or what's how I, I have a new phone number, I'd like to change the phone number. There must be lots of freedom of questions. I think it might be quite difficult to check out the play because it's that it's lots of, I don't understand, uh, pullouts. But acquisitions, I think it's the customer asking pretty much, it's expected, you know, I like to know the premium amount and my age is blah, blah, and what's the best product. I think it's more, you know, expected closed questions. Uh, for the customer service and the cost of saving effect is great. You don't understand how many calls in a day and uh, dealing with those simple inquiries. And however, I'm worried about the, you know, lots of pullouts regarding many questions, different types of questions. And then, and uh, which, which aspect do you think the first thing that we should consider? to show tablets working uh, for insurance, uh, prospecting, acquiring uh, prospect customers or dealing with uh, customer service complaints and in asking uh, uh, simple inquiries. Do you have a FAQ page? Uh, I believe so, but okay. I haven't looked at it, but I believe so. Okay, um, your company has developers, right? Has, has developers on uh, like no, um, um, Actually, I went to Korea to review some vendors. Uh, we don't have, uh, what do you mean when you say chatbot, band, chatbot developers? Uh, anyone who can do like uh, Node.js, uh, just JS or even PHP. Because the solution. Uh, there must yeah. be, yeah, there must be an IT. Uh, yeah. okay. if, if there's an FAQ page, is, uh, I, I mean, we are at Microsoft Place, so I got to promote you on Microsoft, right? But the QA maker.ai yeah, is really good. Q&A maker dot AI. So how it works is it scripts the page, the FAQ thing. Then it just, uh, you can train the bot inside the system as well. So it scripts the page. For example, uh, how much is your your policy and or like how to make claims. So you have a certain uh, like standard protocol. You can copy the whole thing to the bot just like that. Then you can start training the bot such that it can respond to uh, different questions that mean the same thing. Like uh, how much is my premium or how much, how much am I expected to pay? So you can start training and putting like as many questions as you want. So what you're saying is customer service, it can work for customer service. Yeah, the lowest barrier of entry for us in sales, I mean like where we sell to the, the companies, so usually people look for FAQ bots <laughs> because they really got a certain uh, infrastructure in place like the FAQ questions that they want to just plug and play to reduce the time of uh, answering. You know, the thing is, uh, the insurance is a bit you know, conservative, but people are really conservative, you know, they re really worried about the those pull up, I don't know, they, if there's a lot then quite detrimental to you know, cost, you know, company reputation. Yep. Um, it's going to be also you know, detrimental to my reputation as well if I bring in that sort of... Uh, um, you can trust Spencer Norris. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, on, on behalf of uh, Spencer. Yeah, okay, and another thing we can do, right? Uh, okay, IBM also has something good. You can try retrieve and rank. Retrieve and rank. So what we did is, uh, you know Carousel, right? So Carousel, have a, a, they have a FAQ page, but it's quite complicated. So all the languages, all the, all the like, because they are a big company really, so people start to ask them a lot of things. So retrieve and rank can, can work such that uh, it will read the whole FAQ, then it ranks. For example, I asked like, uh, how to sell stuff on Carousel. So it gives you the most important, most relevant question. It reads on the database, and then it shoots back the, the correct thing. So that actually increases the chance of, uh, decreases the chance of screwing up in that sense. Uh. So if you're worried about the bot not responding, or you know, it gives you the weird answers or what, then that actually can help also. Yeah, but I think it's about exploring across the board because every company, every big company now, they are, the, the way they build API is so fast. The updates come also very fast. Yeah, so if you have a developer on your end, it's even better to try to explore. Yeah, because I think the retrieve and rank just updated like yesterday <laughs> when I just checked it as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe I can start off by saying that uh, 
we, 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 we looked into Korean language a little bit. Um, we have a couple of friends um, in Korea who focus on NLP APIs. Um, we were, uh, I think he's one of the pretty good companies. Kono, the founder, uh, is a fan of ours. So I understand that in Korean language, the challenge that what you talked about for uh, insurance company implementation for chatbots, uh, even I think we won't be a good vendor for you guys, is because we have really have zero experience with like Korean. Right? Korean language is very different from English. Um, and it, it's arguably actually, is it easier or more difficult in English? So we actually look into it. So um, it's actually quite difficult for us to just say that we want to pop over the language over. So that's also the problem, right? So if, for English, I think, if we train it to a sufficient um, you know, level, it's actually possible to exhaust um, most of the possibilities um, you know, using, using um, methods and using training of like, customer tickets and so on. So I think when you talked about support and you know, proactive engagement, personally, I think I like to focus on proactive engagement, but the problem with doing that is that when you do proactive engagement on bots, everyone is going to expect support as well. So for example, if you launch an experience like, oh, you know, it's a sales bot or something, everyone's going to ask, what's the weather, or all these kind of weird things. And of course, they're not supposed to, but they will, right? And the thing is that if you're not ready to do that, then you're definitely going to get all those questions. So even if you do proactive engagement, you're still going to get all these reactive questions that you need to handle. So that's why that's also the risk of launching, right? So you'd rather not launch than to launch something that has that. So that's why when we work with enterprises, um, we really make sure that we understand who are the stakeholders that you're working with as well. Is this a CIO level thing? Is it a CMO level thing? Or is it like, for example, is the internal team doing this, right? If it's just the internal team doing this and you are putting your company at risk, then the conversation will not happen, right? It's not gonna happen. So that's why from my perspective for enterprise sales, um, it's my job to figure out with you what level of buy-in do we have? How can we actually make this happen? Is it even technologically feasible for what you're looking for? And then what are the steps that we can use our platform to support you on that? And then are you going to do an RFP? Are you going to invite in Watson? Are you going to invite in Microsoft and all these guys? Or are you going to take on you know, like, um, smaller vendors into the play as well? And you know, are you thinking about it in a three months, six months, one year pro uh, process? Or are you thinking about it from a, you know, a more sort of a pilot perspective? And we don't do free pilots. So companies, some companies do free pilots, some companies don't. We don't do free pilots. So, because of that, you know, there's going to be some considerations down the road. And happy to chat offline if you want to have a meeting about this. Okay, uh, can I have one more question? Uh, we are thinking in Q1 or Q2, you know, because in the chat board is you know, some risky business. We're thinking you know, hiring some chatting agent, real human person, to deal with the customer complaints to be going to accumulate some text uh, uh, histories to build better chatbots. Do you think it's the right way? Or I don't have to, you know, hiring the, the human person to chat to get some more knowledge about, you know, conversation interaction between customers and agents. Um, so I can give you an answer based on the user experience point of view. Uh, so if you, if you want to build a bot that does customer service, uh, of course, in the start, you'll have to give, you'll have to train the bot with a list of questions and a list of all the answers. And the thing is, uh, over here, you have a fixed set of answers, but questions, you, but there are many different ways of asking the same questions. So you have to train your bot in the start uh, for at least a few different ways of asking the same question. Um, and then when you deploy it live, uh, I wouldn't say you actually need to hire someone to just monitor this. Instead, I would say it would be best if you kept your customer, your old customer service people, like don't fire them yet, <laughs> um, but let them just monitor how the bots, I mean the users are speaking to the bots and uh, they might actually give you a lot more insight into uh, uh, the different things that users might mean when, when a bot answers them. So the thing is, a customer service agent is a person and, and, the person and, and your user is also another person. And when two people speak, there's a lot of information that goes from uh, person, person one to person two and a lot of miscommunication might happen. But for a bot, there's always fixed answers. And if a bot gives your user a fixed answer and the, and the uh, user says, oh, now I understand, the customer service agent who is monitoring your bot actually would know that, okay, so that's what the person meant. So 
definitely keep your uh, customer service agents in first, like let them monitor it, uh, and then and then later you can optimize the flow. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Okay, uh, guys, we uh, running short on time. I know there's a lot of burning questions for everybody. Uh, what we'll do now is that uh, please join me to say thank you to our panelists. Uh, give them a round of applause. Um,